Hello everybody, it's Mike. All right, so uh, today I want to respond to a comment that was left on the video having to do with uh, guilt. Guilt after you have gone no contact and the lack of closure. And, uh, you know, I've, I've made a couple of videos trying to respond and I didn't like them, so I erased them. And um, I went back and I watched a video that I had made January 6th, you know, six months ago, five, six months ago. And um, I believe I even said that I had just come back that day from trying to uh, get some closure with my borderline ex. And um, yeah, um, you know, I listened to myself explain what had happened and it brought back a lot of memories. So let me just get to the good part here. Listen, it is possible to be in a state of recovery from your codependence with a borderline and, um, you know, you're not walking around carrying the questions of why, what did I do wrong? Uh, how come they didn't love me and who what, who are they with now and are they happy and what is she doing right now and um, you know all that pain you know because the thing about if you've been in a relationship with an untreated borderline for any length of time you know that can debilitate you for the rest of your life I mean it is such a toxic horrific experience so let me just uh, explain to you once again, if you're new to this channel, this channel is for partners of people who have untreated severe borderline personality disorder. Either you're in a relationship or you have been in a relationship. I am not a counselor. I am not a therapist. Uh, I'm not a mental health professional. I'm not a professional. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not an expert in borderline personality disorder. I don't know what it's like to have it. I only know what it's like to be on the other side and everything I've learned about it since. Do not take anything that I say in this video as a, a substitute for actual advice and therapy from a trained professional. Any actions that you choose to take are your responsibility. All right. So uh, let me just be very clear again. If you are in a relationship with a person who has untreated borderline personality disorder and or even if they are in treatment and it feels toxic and harmful to you and you're in pain and you're miserable, get out. The kindest thing you can do for the borderline is get out. And um, I recommend saying something along these lines. Tell them that, um, that you love them and that the relationship is harmful to you and you need to get out for your own health and that you're going to go no contact. If they still want you in their life, that you recommend that they go to a qualified therapist who deals with borderline personality disorder. And a year later, if they still want you in their life to call you or to contact you, and then you will go and see them in, um, in therapy. You'll meet them in the therapist's office and you can talk about going forward. And um, first and foremost, I say that for your health, because it is, it's, it's toxic. If you feel like you're being destroyed, devalued, you are. It is happening. And I say it also for the untreated borderline. The kindest thing you can do for the borderline is what I just described. Because this is a dance. Now, to take, you know, uh, people think I'm bashing borderlines, and I, I'm really not. Uh, I actually have, you know, I, I, I believe that I have as close to an understanding of what they go through as is possible without actually having felt it. I think that I've, I've got some traits within me that are very close, which is the reason why I was so attracted to, a, you know, an, an extreme borderline. Um, I myself was born at least six weeks, if not two months early. Um, and in 1963, what they did is they threw you in a, you know, in a fish bowl, basically a fish tank, you know, and pumped oxygen in there. I didn't get any love or any touching or holding. I don't know how long I was in there for. I was supposed to die. Apparently I was going to die and I didn't die. 
that couldn't have been good for me. <laughs> I can't imagine that did good things to the neurons in my body and my brain. And, um, you know, and then I had a codependent mother who, looking back on it, may have had borderline tendencies herself. She certainly split on me when I was four. I mean, as I turned from four to five, she, you know, because I wasn't a little baby anymore, she split on me. Um, I remember being left alone for long periods of time. I remember crying for long periods of time by myself. I have vague memories of that. So, you know, I could have become one, you know, under the right circumstances. Maybe I didn't have the genetics. Maybe, you know, I didn't quite break in the right way. I became other stuff that I needed to go, you know, that I'm still in recovery for. But so I'm not bad mouthing the borderlines or vilifying them. I think I think I understand about as much as somebody can without actually having become one. And it's a dance. The non-borderline and the borderline get into this toxic dance. And if it weren't for all of the non-borderlines that go to save and caretake the borderlines, the borderlines would get into therapy much more quickly. No guarantee. They might never choose to get into therapy, but as long as there isn't somebody there to take up the slack for them and, you know, be the supply and do all that stuff and, you know, be there to project on, they would, you know, the pain and the loneliness would drive them to get help. Especially if everybody in the, you know, in the very beginning said, hey, listen, your behavior is really destructive and really hurtful. I don't want to be with you. You're too toxic. If everybody did that, they'd get into therapy much more quickly, just like, you know, every other, you know, uh, mental reaction, illness, you know, whatever you want to call it, that attracts codependence. All right, so um, what about the guilt afterwards? I'm going to read some a comment that has been left uh, by somebody, and I won't read the whole thing. I, I don't have this person's... Um, permission so I won't give their name or read the whole comment but I'll read some of it they'll probably know who they are um, it says some nice things about the channel helping them I'm, I'm happy to hear that um, where I've struggled is with the self-confidence that I did the right thing in breaking off the relationship through going no contact yes you did do the right thing so it's important to understand that uh, there's going to be this guilt. Now, if you are a caretaker and you've been in the relationship, especially if you've been in it for a long time, you've adopted this role of the caretaker, which means that even when they do horrible things that you, know, you wouldn't tolerate from anybody else, if they do it, you, you let them do it, you let them get away with it, and you go, they can't help it, I have to take you know, the slack, and so you go in. They just keep smashing you in the face, and you just keep coming in and wiping the blood off and then picking them up. And So there's going to be guilt just from that, but the guilt that you feel is also induced. So there's seduction and induction. Seduction is when you are overtly trying to give somebody a feeling. You know, when you're trying to seduce somebody in bed, you're trying to get them turned on so that you can, you know, get them to feel a certain way so you can get, have whatever experience you want. Nothing wrong with that. It's part of human life. I'm not judging that. But there's also induced feelings, which is uh, the feeling that is coming that somebody isn't overtly, consciously, but on an unconscious level, they're sending out messages, either through speech or action, or if you want to believe it, energy. They send out that which induces a feeling in you. And so the guilt that you feel is induced. Um, they are splitting on you. They are saying, stay away from me. They're pushing you away. They're physically saying and doing things to push you away. Underneath all of that, the unconscious message is, please don't leave me. I can't be without you. And what they're doing is they're projecting onto you and making you experience what they fear you're going to do to them. The, you know, the genius of the borderline personality disorder, and I'm now focusing on the disorder itself and not the person. The genius of it is that 
it 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 makes the borderline geniuses at making you feel and making you experience what they feel internally about themselves all the time. So the guilt that you feel after you've gone no contact, even if they're the one that has uh, pushed you away, that is induced. And I remember feeling this, you know, when my uh, borderline ex, you know, broke up with me. I mean, who knows how many times she break up with me and hoover me back in. But, um, you know, there was one time she had, you know, she had ended it saying that I was dangerous and she couldn't be around me and blah, 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 and uh, whatever. And, you know, and I, you know, <laughs> early on, and I went, okay. And I didn't, I left her alone. And, and I, I refused every single impulse inside of me to call her up. Now I'm realizing that, that part of that was induced. But I, I didn't follow through with any of that. And I think I said something to the effect of, you know, I'm here when you're ready. I didn't know what I was dealing with then, you know, had I known. But I felt really guilty and I walked around feeling like I, you know, how could I do that to her? How could I reject her like that? And it wasn't conscious. It was just this feeling of guilt and, and constantly thinking about her and, you know, what I needed to do to help her and to fix her. And then it dawned on me consciously. I went, wait a second, I'm feeling guilty like I broke up with her. I didn't break up with her, she broke up with me. What am I feeling guilty for? Why do I feel like I've abandoned her and that she's in pain and she's lonely? She's the one that left me. Well, if I were to go back in time, I would tell myself that that was an induced feeling, that she had induced that in me so that I would actually chase after her and who knows what dynamic she might still push me away or whatever dynamic we would play out. But uh, at the very least, it would leave me open, which is exactly what happened because I had made the decision. I was in pain and I had made the decision that I didn't want to have anything to do with her. I could feel that something toxic was going on and that it wasn't good, even though I really wanted her and I really loved her and I, all those other things I thought I was feeling. There was a part of me that was saying, this is not healthy, you know, stay away, just stay away. And I had made the decision that that's what I was going to do. But as soon as the phone rang and it was her and I wasn't going to answer it, of course I answered it. And then I wasn't going to take her back. And then she said, I want to get back together with you. And I said, okay. And then I hung up the phone and I felt so, I was more afraid then. I was like, what have I just done? I was so, so scared because I knew I'd just been pulled back into the spider's web. And um, so, um, you know, that guilt stayed with me. It didn't leave. Every time I, you know, she split on me, I had that induced guilt. And I also take responsibility that I had my own codependent guilt and my own codependent denial. So let's talk about the denial part. So part of the guilt, when you're feeling guilty, it's denial over the fact that you still want them, that you still want to chase after the unreachable, unattainable person because you're replaying whatever, you know, rejection trauma you went through as a kid. For me, it was my mom. Actually, it actually was everybody in my family. Um, everybody in my family pushed me away at some point as, as you know, I was the youngest kid in a really dysfunctional family and everybody, everybody devalued me and pushed me away at some point. So she was perfect. So of course I fell in love with her because that's what I had been programmed as a kid to love. And of course I had just gone through, you know, the loss of my soulmate, you know, who passed away and the emptiness left in there. So I was just primed and ready for this this, you know, poor borderline who saw in me somebody, you know, she saw real love in me. She saw real health in me. She saw real strength in me and she wanted that. And, you know, sad for her, you know, she wasn't able to stay with somebody who would have. And I would have, you know, I, I'm glad now that it didn't work out because I don't, I don't want that. You know, I'm consciously making the decision in my life now that I'm only going to be with somebody because I want to be with them and not for any other reason. And so I've, you know, I've rejected a few, you know, offers that have come my way of women that I've gone out and dated and met with. And, you know, they've, they've been very interested and I have, um, you know, rejected them. And it's because I sit with myself and I just go, no, I don't feel like 
you know, I, I the only reason I would be staying would be out of there would be some part of me that would be feeling like, well, she loves me. I have to stay. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm, you know, if that means I'm single for the rest of my life, which I really hope that's not the case, but you know, it's better to be alone and have a sense of self and have self-confidence and have, have health and happiness than it is to be in a toxic relationship. So it's okay to be alone, number one. Part of what's happening is you don't know how to be alone and you don't know how to be. The only way you know how to be is with somebody that's abusing you and devaluing you. So that's part of all the guilt, which is the guilt that you're feeling when you're making it about them. It's really denial. But there's other things this person says, which I think are important. And so I'm going to uh, bring that up. Okay, so he talks about some personal stuff, which I, I don't we don't need to share because it really it's it's not super uh, valuable to the question. But and also I don't have his permission to share his personal life. So um, I struggle with questions like. Because uh, he's gone, he says that he uh, went no contact. He says, I struggle with questions like, how did it work out for the other guy and not me? Did she get better with the other guy? So let's start out. How did it work out for the other guy and not me? First off, you don't know that it's working out for the other guy. You only know what you think you see. Very likely she may be presenting uh, a facade to the world. Um, also, he may be, he probably is less conscious than you, which is why she picked him, because your consciousness was too much, because you were actually more successful at loving her. So he may not be as successful at loving her. He may not be as aware. He might be uh, messed up himself. He might be uh, a narcissist. You don't know. But more than likely, he has, he's further away from his feelings. And, um, you know, so, and we don't even know. We don't know what hell he's going through. We don't know. We don't know what's going on behind closed doors. And as you know, what goes on behind closed doors and what goes on in public, two completely different things. So first off, you don't know that it worked for the other guy. He's with her now. And according to what I read, he's been with her for a while, which I don't know what that means. But we've seen here that you know, these relationships, the borderline codependent relationship can last decades, but the final discard will come. So at some point, this guy, when she has taken all of his self-esteem and taken all of the love that she can from him, um, maybe he's, you know, he's better, he's more codependent, he's, he's able to, to do the dance better. It doesn't mean that they're happy at all. It's just he's able to uh, you know, whatever, we don't know. But trust me, the discard will come. It will. Either he will at some point, uh, like you did, realize that, you know, because she'll do the same thing to him she did to you. It's not like, like she's madly in love with him just because she has a family and a business. Now she's just more deeply entrenched. We don't know. I am assuming that your ex-partner is uh, untreated, and is a severe borderline. I'm assuming that. She could have gotten therapy. She, you know, I, I hear sometimes that they can um, recover on their own. I don't understand how that works, but I've read it, so maybe that is, those are all possibilities. The likelihood of those things are pretty slim. So more than likely, they are just doing the dance. He's not doing okay. She's not doing okay. They're just it hasn't gotten to the point where she's left him yet, as far as we know. She could be cheating on him for all we know. We don't know what's going on. He might, like I said, he might be cheating on her, which makes her want to stay with him more. We don't know. So that question, you don't know that. That's your, I did that same too, that same thing too. You're, you're projecting onto them, wow, I'm because she was so good at devaluing you and because you're a codependent anyway, you're already internally had that waiting to come out you're just projecting on to that oh i'm not lovable enough he's doing something better she loves him more she didn't love me you don't know any of that you don't know any of that so that question is meaningless but i understand it and um the one of the questions is you know uh, one of my one of my teachers would say rejection is god's protection so um, if it didn't work out, 
you know, take that as a good sign because that could have been you. And according to you, um, you broke it off because she was going to, here's what I think probably would have happened. Are you ready? Um, according to you, because she was unfaithful and that she was telling you she was going to go forward with a new relationship, but she didn't want to give you up. Now, I'm not reading you for verbatim, but that's what you said here. Here's what I think would have happened. Yeah, she was testing you as well as telling you the truth. If you had said, okay, well, you know what? I, I can still have an open relationship. I think it can work. You know, I looking back on it, there's two borderlines. One that, you know, didn't work out uh, almost immediately. Looking back on it, she definitely was borderline. And the one I was with, the one I was with was communicating with me while she was breaking up with her, you know, her then ex. And she still kept him in, his, in her life. He was still around, waiting. Now, of course, I was thinking, well, you know, I'm, you know, uh, I, I'm better, she, he's this horrible person, and I'm the good one, and so we're okay. But looking back on it now, <laughs> you know, she kept him around. She kept him around in case things didn't work out or in case she needed to do whatever she needed to do, you know, whatever. Um, either way, even if, all the, even if that isn't true, you know, the boundaries were so bad she kept him around. Um, so had you not left she would have bounced back and forth between you and this other guy. And maybe she would have, you know, discarded him and stayed with you. You don't know. But thank the gods that you aren't, that that didn't happen. She would have torn you to pieces as well as the other guy. So, yeah, you know, you were right in saying, you know, she's all yours, man. Because, you know, nothing good was going to come out of that. So you don't know that, you know, you're acting like you failed and he succeeded. You don't know that. Uh, so uh, anyway, those are just things to think about. Did she get better with the other guy? Possibly. We don't know. Did she go to therapy? Maybe. Um, did she get better on her own? Maybe. Did he have the magic tool? I guess it's possible. Anything's possible. Did he do the magic thing that allowed her to look at herself and get better? Maybe, but so what? Then we start to look at our own selfishness because, you know, I remember after my marriage with looking back on it, my, my uh, ex who definitely had borderline tendencies, if she wasn't borderline altogether, but I don't think she was. I think she just had tendencies. But, you know, I was, you know, upset afterwards and I did the thing that, you know, ex-husbands do. And I started saying, you know, she this and that. And then she's with the other guy. And, uh, you know, she ended up with one of my friends. You know, as soon as I was out of the picture, she hooked up with one of my friends after I moved away. Um, and, um, you know, my, my therapist at the time said, why aren't you happy for her? Can you be happy for her? So... You know, um, did she get better with the other guy? What if she did? You know, yeah, it's it's okay to 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 let go of your own selfishness and go. It's selfish of me for her for, you know, her, her not to not want her to get better. Next question you ask is, what's the key to their stable, long-lasting relationship? First off, you don't know that it's stable, and long-lasting doesn't mean anything. Because as we've seen, um, and this is coming not just from me, but from other borderlines who are in uh, recovery, uh, the discard will come. The final discard will come. Maybe it's taking longer, but it's going to be worse because she's got kids with him and a business with him. So you don't want to be that guy. Trust me, you do not want to be that guy. They don't have a stable, long-lasting relationship. They're still together. So that means that it's long lasting. Is it stable? We don't know that. I bet probably not. It's probably really sick and dysfunctional and it just looks like they're together. I mean, I was with my now ex-wife. We were together for 10 years. We slept in separate bedrooms throughout the whole time we were together, except for the first year, maybe. I can't even remember, it was so long ago. You know, we barely had sex. Um, you know, 
We were basically just roommates. But we looked great out in public. We did all kinds of things together out in public, you know, and she wanted that, but we didn't have anything. Was it stable and long lasting? I mean, I was with her for 10 years. That's a long time. Was it stable? Yeah. I didn't cheat on any with anybody. She didn't cheat. Was it stable? Yeah. Does that mean we were happy? So you don't know any of this. This is all your projection coming from your own insecurity. The real problem is, is why are you still thinking about her? Don't get me. I'm not judging you. I, I understand because had I not done the work. So let me now do the plug for my three step process, three pronged approach. I didn't make it up. Everybody I know who has done this in all different kinds of dysfunctions and problems has achieved a state of ongoing recovery. Number one, go to therapy with uh, a, in this case, go to therapy with a counselor who is licensed and is qualified to help you with codependence from cluster B personality relationships. Number two, go to Codependence Anonymous. You can go online now to coda.org and uh, go to a Zoom meeting. You can get a Zoom meeting. Forget about the whole COVID thing. You can get a Zoom meeting. Find a sponsor. Work the fourth step and the tenth step. Of course, work all the steps, but keep working four and ten all the time. That was the main thing I did is I focused on these kinds of questions. These are the kinds of questions you're going to want to do a fourth step on. But, you know, get a sponsor who's gone through them and follow directions. But you got to look at why you chose her, why you wanted to be with her, and why you're still thinking about her. There's some selfish, self-centered narcissism and pain and unresolved trauma within you. That is, uh, you know, as some people say, and it's very true, it's a trauma response. Your feelings for her are a trauma response. They're not true love. So you need to look at that and get honest with that. And then number three, have a spiritual discipline. I use the word discipline because don't just have a spiritual belief. That doesn't necessarily mean anything. Have something. You go to church. You meditate. You do yoga. You do tai chi. Something that you're doing on a constant basis for spiritual action and self-reflection. Three things. Therapy, 12 steps, spiritual discipline. Those three things are the things that I dove into. Once it became clear what had happened and what was going on with me and that I was in, that I had to wake up and go, I'm a codependent. And it wasn't easy for me to do it. When I was, you know, in the midst of it, I was in denial. And I remember asking myself, because I know all about codependence. I said, I'm a codependent. No, I don't think I'm codependent. I think I'm... I think I'm, I was codependent. And when I went, I'm a codependent and I need help, I got my ass to a CODA meeting. And I started working with my, uh, my therapist on my codependency. And I started doing the spiritual work. But the one thing that I did that saved my ass, which has before in my, my other 12-step work, is I did the fourth step, which is I looked at my resentments and my expectations and I found out where I was coming from my own unconscious selfishness that's what saved me and i think i think it you know i think anybody can benefit from it you know why were you incompatible was your last question here how about this for an answer you were too healthy for her the fact that you had the strength to decide to end it and go no contact shows that you had a strength and a health that the other guy doesn't i guarantee you he does not have it he doesn't, he may have wanted to leave. He's probably talked about it. There's been talk about them breaking up and he can't, you know, whatever she does to keep him there, whatever guilt tactic she uses, you know, he stays. So trust me, it's not that, you know, what made you incompatible was that you were too healthy for her. So that I know, because if not, you, you would have stayed. You, I mean, look, you're healthier than I was. The only reason I went no contact was because she started first. And, um, you know, I knew she was going to come back because I had, you know, the last time, I think, you know, on the day that I made one of these videos, I think I was even there. And I was saying, I, I don't know why I was asking. I guess I, I guess the, there was a, my codependence was kicking in. And I said, um, so you really don't want to ever have anything to do with me ever again, do you? And she said, she started to say something about, well, maybe in a month, 
or maybe in a couple of months. And, and I said, well, what's going to be different in a couple of months? And then she started, you know, the smoke started coming out of her ears. And, okay. um, but that, you know, I took away with that going, she's going to, she's going to be back. So when I finally, you know, the last conversation, which was after she flipped out and ran in the house because she couldn't handle questions like, you know, why did you switch from one day to the next? Or, you know, some, a simple question drove her crazy and she ran into the house screaming. Then she called me back and then, you know, wanted to finalize it over the phone. And uh, after she had, whatever she had said along the lines of whatever, I don't want anything to do with you or, um, you know, you, I was scraping the barrel, you know, I was just feeling sorry for you and, you know, you're trying to destroy my life and I can't have anything to do with you. Um, I said very calmly, I said, um, you're right. Uh, I believe that um, our karma for this life has come to an end and uh, I, I agree with you. I don't think we should have any contact. And I said, you've harmed me. You know, I was, all, I was very calm about it. I said, but you've harmed me more than anybody has in my whole life. You've broken every single promise that you've made to me. And I really hope you don't do this to somebody else. And I said, um, but I completely agree with you. We're done. I would like for you to block my phone, block my Facebook, email. I would like for you to destroy any means of contact you have for me. I can never have contact with you again. Goodbye. And I hung up. And then I proceeded to block everything. So you did better than me. You chose to do that. I only did it because she was doing it and it was an opportunity for me to then use that to, you know, but had she not blocked, had she not blocked contact with me, I might still be with her. So just because I say all this now in hindsight doesn't mean, you know, that I was stronger than you were. I'm in a good place now and I can tell you I want nothing to do with her. I can honestly say that I don't even know what, you know, there's, I don't even know what she could possibly do to make me feel to trust her. But I'm also in a place of safety where she's not trying to hoover me back in. And you know how they are when they want to try and hoover you back in. They're really good at it. So I'm not so full of myself to think that I'm bulletproof, which is why I choose to continue to make sure that her phone number is blocked and everything else's email is blocked and that I continue to do the work and I continue to work the steps. I continue to work with my sponsor and I continue to do my spiritual practice. Which, and part of that is this, doing this channel has really helped me. Now, I went back for the first time today and watched myself from six months ago. And I was like, holy crap, because I was explaining things that had happened. And I was like, I forgot all about that. You know, it's making me really appreciate um, that I was with somebody who had a mental illness. So let me answer all of those questions. How did it work out for the other guy and not me? Because she has a mental illness. Did she get better with the other guy? Most likely not. She has a mental illness. What's the key to their stable, long-lasting relationship? He is sicker than you are. She has a mental illness. Why was I incompatible? Because you're not as mentally ill as she is. You know, you, they're together because they're both as sick. You know, the length of time of them together... Shows you how sick they were. With my ex, the longest relationship she was in was a guy who was a narcissist. And she told me the, the stuff and the torture and the abuse, I mean, that, that he heaped upon her. I don't even want to tell you the shit that he did to her. But she stayed with him because he didn't love her. He was a psychopath. So there was no reason for her to leave because he wouldn't love her. But being, you know, the, the quiet borderline that she was, she eventually wore him down and then feasted on him. Just absolutely got him down to his bare bones because she explained to me everything that happened. And I'm like, wow, you, you just really tore that guy to pieces. But I thought it was okay because he, he was a narcissist and I'm not. So, you know, he, he was, you know, whatever. 
but uh, they were together for a long time. So that's why it worked out. He's sicker than you are, and she has a mental illness. All right, so that's it for me. Uh, that's all I'm going to say. Um, by the way, as you can see right here, the little borderline is crying. You can put on your trauma responder cape and go and save her by just very gently mousing over her little tiny crying face. And by subscribing, she will be magically cured of borderline personality disorder and she will be happy and she'll grow up to have a wonderful life. So that's it. If you, uh, if you subscribe, she'll stop crying. All right, that's it. Again, this link, I said, you know, it was going to take me a week. It's going to take me longer than that. I'm really spending some time on that. But people have asked me if I would counsel them. I'm not a counselor. And, you know, I don't think that's a good idea for anybody. But I do think it would be a good idea for me to share some specific things that I do, some exercises, some, you know, some specific things that I've done that helped me. And uh, I'll do that and put that on that uh, website when it's time. So I'll let you know when it's up and running. You know, if it's months afterwards, go check it out. It might be there. Okay, that's it for me. All right, guys, I will see you all next time. Take care.